Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Amen. Good morning. Y'all glad to be here? Yeah. All right, so you would think with one service starting at 11 that I would have gotten some sleep last night and slept in and gotten here a little bit later, but no, I got up at my regular time, got here at my regular time, and then just kind of sat around and waited. I mean, it was weird. I mean, 11 o'clock, one service, 11 o'clock sounded like a good idea because we were like, yeah, we can sleep late, just have one service, but I don't know. It's, there's something just that gets excited in me about this. And I just woke up and sprung up. And what's weird about that is I didn't get home until 11 o'clock last night. I didn't go to bed till almost 1. And so I was really looking forward to that extra couple hours of sleep. We were in Arlington last night watching the Longview Lobos end an 81-year yeah, drought of a state championship. That's where my mother and my wife's mother and uh, my, all my aunts and uncles all graduated from Longview. And it was crazy being around those people. They had waited 81 years for that. And I just, I just, yeah, waiting, waiting, waiting. You know, we do a lot of waiting this time of year, don't we? Think about it for a second. If you have kids or if you've ever raised kids... You know what I'm talking about, because 10 times a day, every day, my daughter asked, Daddy, what'd you get me for Christmas? Daddy, what'd you get me for Christmas? Daddy, what'd you get me for Christmas? Just wait. You know what I'm saying? A lot of waiting and a lot of hoping this time of year. You know, and it's funny because I look at my son and my daughter, and it's funny the things that they hope that they get for Christmas, when in reality, it's been things that they've demanded that I get them. Have you ever noticed that? And what's interesting about this whole idea of watching my kids, and I'm going to pick on us adults here in just a minute, so don't laugh too hard, but it's amazing while I'm watching my kids go through this hope and wait, this hoping I get what I demanded you to get me, and while I wait for Christmas morning so I can get the gift that I'm hoping for, that I demanded that you get me, Daddy, this is what I want, I never promised them any of that stuff. When did I ever promise them what they're going to get for Christmas? And I was having this conversation with Ashley, as in fact, last night on the way home. I was like, you know, all this stuff that Boston and Ainsley are telling us to get them for Christmas, when did we ever promise them that we would do this? I mean, as far as I'm concerned, my contractual obligation of a parent ends at you have a home, you have clothes, and you get food. And that's it, okay? Everything else, everything else is a blessing. But hold on a second. And then I look at me, and I look at all the things I demand, you know, that I want. I hope that I can have. The, I would really love a new zero-turn mower, right? I would really love a new screened-in porch door because my 65-pound puppy ate my other one. All right, I, I would really love a new bumper on my truck because I've backed into two trees since I've owned it. My wife would really love new furniture. I mean, there's things that we want. There's things that we demand, and there's things that we hope for. I mean, Edward is hoping for that Red Rider Carbone Action BB gun, you know, for Christmas. But Danielle keeps telling him he'll shoot his eye out, so I don't think he's going to get it. There's a lot of things. Think about it. That we as adults, we go through life, and this is what we do. We don't do it with our parents per se. Now, at least I hope you don't at 40, 50 years old demand your parents. 
But check this out. We do this with God. Think about this for a second. There are things that we want. There are things that are important to us. I mean, look, we, we, we get the necessities, right? Food, clothes, a home that we can live in, healthy children, a healthy spouse, all of these things that we want. And I don't know about you, but for me, I find myself oftentimes in my prayer life, much like my kids when they come up to me and say, Dad, this is what you're getting me for Christmas. Go into God and saying, God, this is what you will do for me. Now, I may not say it like that. I may word it in that churchy, crafty, because I've been in church long enough, and I may word it. It may sound like I'm asking him to do something in my life. But if I was honest with God and myself and with you, I'm, I'm demanding that he show up. You know, we've been in this series. We've been talking about the Christmas story. We know we looked at Mary and we looked at Joseph and the emotions they must have felt when they heard that they were going to be raising the Son of God. If you were here the last two weeks, we've talked about anger and, and sadness when all we really want is joy. And, and how do we experience joy when all we feel is anger and sadness? Last week, we talked about fear and stepping into our fear to experience the peace that only God can bring. And I'm wondering during this season, for many of us, as we're wrestling with a lot of our fears and a lot of our sadness and a lot of our anger and, frankly, just a lot of our doubts, this season, what we're hoping for is not a BB gun. It's not a new screened-in porch door. It's not a zero-turn mower. It's not an Xbox. I mean, we, we want somebody in our life to be healed. You know, they've got cancer. We, we've got a wayward child that we're begging that God would bring home. Heck, we've, we've got a wayward parent that we're bringing that God would bring home. We've got people in our family that are struggling. We've got death. We've got poverty. And, and we see that, you know, during this time of year, that, and this is when all these emotions rise up, that we get fearful and we get, we get angry. And all the while, we just, we just want a little bit of hope. And, and in our prayers and in our sometimes shaking our fist at God, it just feels like we're just waiting. We're just waiting for God to show up and do something. And so I'm wondering this morning as we wrap up this Christmas story, I wonder if we could talk about hope for a little bit. I wonder if we could talk about hope and where, where is hope? Where do we find hope? What is hope? You know, hope in Webster is commonly defined as a wish. You know, it's a wish. It's a strength of the person that desires something. So Webster would define hope as if you desire something and you desire it with all your heart, and that strength within you really, really wishes that you get that, and that is, that is hope. That is hope that something will happen for you. That is hope that something will be given to you. But biblical hope is something totally different. In fact, biblical hope really has nothing to do with us. We have no part in it, much like when we talked about finding joy in a world full of anger and sadness. All right, the anger and sadness that belongs to us, but joy belongs to the Father, and it's been given to us as a gift. Same thing with peace, belongs to the Father. It's been given to us as a gift through the Holy Spirit. Hope is much the same way. Hope has nothing to do with us. And while Webster defines hope as something that is within us, the Bible defines hope as the confident expectation of what God has promised. So biblical hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised. And its strength, the strength of hope, is in His faithfulness. It has nothing to do with us. It doesn't have anything to do with our demands. It doesn't have anything to do with our wishes. It doesn't have anything to do with how much we believe and want and yearn for something to happen. Biblical hope is the confident expectation of God's promises, and it's based in His faithfulness. You know, the Israelites experienced something that none of us can comprehend. 400 years of silence. 
from the Old Testament when that last prophet penned that last prophecy letter to when uh, Jesus showed up in the New Testament, there was nothing. There was a lot of hoping and waiting. Probably a lot of campfire stories of grandfathers and grandmothers telling grandchildren about the God that delivered them out of Egypt and the God that rescued Daniel from the lion's den. The God that, that, that chose them as, as their people. And then just a lot of waiting. Well, where is this God? We've not heard from this God and just a lot of waiting, and just a lot of hoping. And I wonder, you know, what would have been going on during that 400 years? Could there possibly have been any, I don't know, anger? Sadness? Fear? When all the while, all they really wanted was joy, peace, and hope. 400 years, nothing. And then one day, one night... An angel appears to a young virgin and scares the mess out of her. And think about this. 400 years of nothing and then one night an angel of the Lord appears to a little girl, a teenager, and scares the mess out of her. Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. Who? What? What? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Imagine what that must have been like. Hearing from God after all of that silence. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever in his kingdom. There will be no end and how Mary must have felt, but then all the while this thing that must have been playing out, this fear, this anger, this sadness that we addressed over the last two weeks, but all the while knowing, you know, I've heard this before. I've heard this before. Grandmother, grandfather has talked about this, this Savior, this Messiah that was to come and what that must have felt like for the first time in a long time, in all of that waiting, in all of that hope, and finally, just a glimmer, just a glimpse, just a smidge of a promise being fulfilled. That after 400 years of silence, after 400 years of waiting and hoping and waiting and hoping, and waiting and hoping, God begins to fulfill a promise. You know, I wonder how many of us, not in just this season, but just in life in general, go through seasons, not 400 years, but seasons, maybe 40 days, maybe 400 hours, maybe 400 minutes of silence, of wondering, is God even there? Does God even care? Is God even going to do something? And, 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 and what emotions come up for us? Anger, fear, sadness, um, waiting, hoping, frustration. And us wondering, is God ever going to show up? And if we can glean anything from this season of celebrating the birth of Christ, is that yes, we do have hope that at some point God will show up up. It may not look like the way we want it to look. You know, Mary and Joseph had their whole lives planned out. Never in a million years did they dream that this Messiah that they had been told at, around campfires that they had read about in those Old Testament scriptures would actually be in her womb. It never looks, it rarely looks like we think it's going to look but there's a promise. There's a promise for us. And oftentimes for us humans, when we get 
in the waiting and the hoping period, we allow those emotions of fear and anger and sadness to well up and we sit in the silence in our emotions and all the while over here there's a promise that I think we've forgotten. And maybe I'm the only one that needs to be reminded during this season that there is still a promise. A promise that's been given to us as believers. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, this is uh, shortly after Jesus is born, and Mary and Joseph are taking him to the temple for sort of like a dedication. They're presenting him to the chief priest, presenting him to the Lord, per se. And they run into a very interesting man at the temple named Simeon. Now in Luke 2, starting in verse 25, it says this. Now there, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Verse 26. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Time out. Have you ever felt like you had a word from God? Have you ever felt like maybe in your quiet time, maybe somebody came up and just said, you know, uh, I see this or whatever, and you just know in your heart of hearts that this was from God, okay? And then have you ever taken that and then just kind of gone through life and then look back over, oh, I don't know, a month, two months, six months, a year, and think, is it ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? Imagine what Simeon must have felt. Scripture doesn't say when this was revealed to him, but imagine, say it was a month, what that 30 days must have been like to know that I am not going to die until I lay my eyes on the Messiah? What if it was a year? What if it was two years? What if it was 30 years? He was very old in age. What if it was 50 years? Can you imagine the waiting, the anticipation, the is it ever going to happen, the doubting? You ever been there? You ever waited so long that you begin to doubt? You ever read through Revelations? Be honest. You ever read through Revelations? And I'm going to read something there at the end. But you ever read and you ever get to the end of the book? Mark likes to say, hey, I've read the, the end of the book. We win. Be honest. But have you ever doubted? When? I mean, you say you're coming back. When? I'm the only one. Two. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. Could you imagine 400 years? Could you imagine Simeon? Okay, is this really going to happen? Every baby that walks by him, like tearing off, no, no, no. Think about it. Verse 27. And he came in the spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he, this is Simeon, he took him up in his arms, and he blessed God, and he said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation, that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Verse 33, and his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce through your own soul also so that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. God kept his promise to Simeon. We don't know how long Simeon had to wait. We don't know how, how long he waited. We don't know if he had any doubts. We don't know if he had any fear. We don't, we don't know any of that. All we know is that God made a promise and he kept it. God made a promise to Israel. 
long ago, and he kept it. And we gather this season every year, and we read this Christmas story every year, and we talk about the birth of Christ every year because, and we're sitting here today, 2,000 years past, after the events of Jesus' life, after the events of him going to the cross and paying the price for our sins and giving us eternal life and conquering death and raising from the grave and ascending into heaven, and we're all sitting here today and we're singing these great songs and we're hugging each other because God kept his promise. And the hope, the hope of the world was not based in anything that the world could do. It was based in a promise that God made and his faithfulness to keep it. Simeon had hope because he had a promise from God. You know, I think about all the heroes of the faith and the promises that were made to them. I was wrestling this morning, just kind of sitting here waiting, and I started thinking about Moses for some reason. I started thinking about, you know, Moses was called to deliver God's people out of Israel, and God told Moses, they're, they're going to conquer this land. It's going to happen. And when God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. That's a promise. Moses never saw it. Interesting. That sometimes we can wait and 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 and somebody else is going to get to see what we know God's going to do. It's amazing. Simeon was told, you will not die until you see the Christ. And God fulfilled a promise. And I'm wondering, as I'm thinking about the 400 years of silence, and I'm thinking about Simeon waiting in the anticipation, I'm looking at Ainsley this morning, and again, Daddy, what'd you get me for Christmas? Two more days, woo Santa Claus, blah, 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 blah. And just the anticipation that's overflowing from a nine-year-old girl that's getting something that will probably be given away next year. <laughs> Truth? And I'm thinking, my gosh, what must Simeon have felt like every day since he heard that word from the Lord. It's today the day that I see the Christ. It's today the day that I put my hands on the Messiah. It's today the day that God fulfills his promise. It's today the day. And then I started thinking about me. And then I started thinking about you And I started thinking about all the things that come across my desk, all the phone calls that come through my cell phone, all the text messages that I get. I need healing. I need him to come home. I need her to be sober. And I'm thinking, is today the day? And then my heart goes out, and I start thinking, you know, I'm in, a, I'm in a good season of life. You know, Edward always teases at me, I'm either really down or I'm really up. Well, I'm in a really upswing right now, Edward, so enjoy it while it lasts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I've struggled through this series because I've been preaching out of that tower, Joe, of sadness and fear. And I know not everybody's there, but then I look across this room and I know that the vast majority of you are because you tell me what's going on in your life. And I wonder what that must be like. I know what it was like for me. There was a season in my life where I woke up every day. God, is today the day? Is today the day that you do this? Is today the day that you're going to show up and do this is today the day and if not today when and then doubts begin to creep in well maybe it's never going to happen and then the enemy comes in with those doubts and says aha i mean how many times have we been made fun of as a christian community because we're looking to the sky for the return of jesus and people walking by going ah, never going to happen never going to happen it's interesting isn't it the waiting. And so I'm wondering if we can learn anything through this season, we can learn this. We've got a choice. I think Simeon had a choice. I think in every day he could have sat in frustration. 
He could have said in some anger, well, if not today, when? He could have said in some sadness. Or he could have just rested in the promise. And so for us, what does that mean? Well, I think for us, we need to cling to the promise. And we need to understand, and guys, I'm going to say something, and some of you may not like what I'm about to say. I don't like what I'm about to say. But when we're talking about this promise, we're talking about really the only thing that God has promised us. And when I read Scripture over and over and over again, I study the life of Jesus, and I study the prophecies, and I study the end. I know, Mark, I've read the end. We're going to win eventually. I can really only find that God has promised me eternal life through Jesus Christ, my Savior. He's promised me that he'll never leave me, and he'll never forsake me. Other than that, I think everything else is up for grabs. And so when I'm hurting and I want this and I demand that this be done, when it doesn't happen or it hasn't happened yet, I don't lose hope because my hope is not based on me and my wants. My hope is based in a promise. It's based in a promise that God gave Abraham. You know, God promised Abraham that he would have not just a child, but that he would be the father of many nations. God, it's based in a hope that God affirmed in Isaac and then Jacob. It's based in a promise that God gave King David when he said, your throne will be established forever. There was coming one that will sit on your throne forever. It's based in a promise that was spoken through Isaiah, and Isaiah spoke it to Israel when Isaiah spoke about this promise and foretold the birth of Jesus, exactly how it was going to happen, foretold the death of Jesus, exactly how it was going to happen, and woven all through history, all through the Old Testament, you see God affirming this promise that one day there will be a light to come into the world, a servant, a righteous king, a savior that will save people from their sins, that will sit on the throne forever. And as much as I want a screen door, And as much as I want my children to grow up and serve the Lord, I've never been promised that. As much as I want my friend to be healed of cancer, I've never been promised that. As much as I want some folks in my family to come to know the Lord, I've never really been promised that. It can happen. But while I wait and while I hope, my real hope is in the promise. Over and over and over again, God made this promise. He affirmed this promise to Israel, and then they waited. (laughs) and waited, and waited, and waited, and waited, until one night, a little girl, a little teenager, was sitting by herself, and God appeared and began to fulfill that promise. And now for us, we have a promise, that one day Jesus is coming back, And as much as we celebrate the birth of Christ, we look to the death of Christ and his resurrection, and then we look forward to what Jesus promised when he told his disciples that he was coming back to get them, that he was coming back to right all wrongs, that he was coming back to redeem all of his people, that he was coming back to restore all things. The humans, 
the animals, the plants, the new heaven, the new earth, and we wait, and we wait, and we wait, and we have a choice. Because if you're like me, you begin to doubt and you begin to wonder, is it ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? Is he ever coming back? Is he ever coming back to do what he said he was going to do? And we wait, and we wait, and we wait. In Revelation, John saw a new heaven and a new earth. And he wrote, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. Is that ever going to happen? When? When? He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Does that sound familiar? That was a promise that God told the Israelites that he was sending someone to walk with them, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means what? God with us, 400 years. Is it ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? Is it ever going to happen? And now we get the same promise that one day Jesus is coming back and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, and we will dwell with him, and he will be with us, and he will be our God. And then check this out. He will wipe every tear from our eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain, for the former things have passed away. That is a promise. And that is where hope is. And so now we wait. I mean, what else is there? What else is there? You know, when you think about it, life is good, but there are going to be times when all we really have in this life is hope. You know, I talk to people all the time. They don't know what they're going to do. And I'm just wondering, I'm like, you know, what else is there? When you lose your job, what else is there other than hope? When you, when you know that divorce is imminent, what else is there? but hope. When you see that illness seems to be winning and in control, what else is there but hope? When addiction takes over and is winning, what else is there? Hope. When poverty is rampant, what else is there? Hope. When hunger seems to be everywhere, what else is there? Hope. When your family is hurting, what do you have? Hope. When that wayward child won't come back, what do you have? Hope. When life just sucks, what do you have? Hope. Our God is faithful. He is faithful to keep his promise. If I've learned anything in this season of my life during this Christmas season is that God fulfills his promises. If we can learn anything from the Christmas story, we can learn that, yeah, it took a long time. And we don't know why it took a long time. And we know there was thousands and thousands of years of stuff going on, and then there was 400 years of silence. But God did fulfill his promise when Jesus was born. And if we can learn anything during this season, that 33 years after that, that God fulfilled another promise when he put his son on the cross to pay a penalty that you and I couldn't pay. And if we can learn anything else, and just a few days after that, God raised Jesus from the dead and fulfilled another promise when he said that there would be a king on the throne of David forever as he ascended into heaven, and he's still sitting there today. 
And now we wait with hopeful expectation that one day he is coming back for his people and that we will be with him forever. Summit, we have hope. And so here's my challenge to you this season and for the next 400 years while we wait or for the next 40 days while we wait. If you want to doubt, doubt. I doubt every day. But cling to the promise and then go live your life in such a way that people look at you and say, something's different about them. And then you go love people and you go share the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Well, Father, you're good and I love you. And I thank you for Jesus. And God, I just pray right now. And I'm just wondering if there's anybody here today, Father, in the quietness of this moment that needs a touch from you that needs hope. And God, if there is, I pray you'd speak to their hearts. Father, that you love them. You love them in their doubts. You love them in their unbelief. You love them in their anger. You love them in their sadness. And God, that they would feel your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. So in the quietness of this moment, I just wonder, is there anybody here that would be bold enough to say, that's me, I need some hope? If you would raise your hand, amen. And I don't know what that looks like for you. You may not even know Jesus. You may know Jesus and you may just be struggling. Father, I just thank you that you have given us a Savior. God, I thank you that you've given us a promise. And Father, I pray for everyone in this room that needs a touch from you, God, that they would feel it, not just during this season, but every day. God, thank you for this church. Thank you for my pastor and my elders. God, I just pray that as we gather tomorrow night, God, that your presence would be thick. And God, we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.